unidentifiable flying object. The UFO continues to be a mystery. Wasn't alone in space. Fighting the UFO. Something out there. Close enough to be observed. What could it be? It could only be one thing. A UFO. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 82 of UFO No, your constant break from the propaganda, which is just outrageous. The bad news, which is even more terrible. And of course, the political nonsense that we can't seem to get away from and have some fun talking about awesome topics like Valiant Thor. Oh, yeah, by request, by the way. Joining me is Ed. What's up, Ed? What up? What's going on, man? How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. No intro today? What the fuck, man? No. What the fuck? Well, dude, now you're a regular. You know, we kind of of talked about this. We were like, (laughs) all right, now look. You know, we're going steady. The magic is diminishing. Let's settle down. You know what I mean? That's true. I just like the special <laughs> attention. It's nice. Well, of course. And I get it. Well, look, because of that, of course, we got to give him a little bit. Of, why isn't it doing it? Give it to me. Give it oh. to me. There she is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I thrive Anyways. for. <laughs> uh, so, Ed, uh, we are in the stratosphere floating around 151,000 feet, a little over. Not bad. Uh, how Not bad. how are you? How's your altitude? Oh, I'm right up there. Yeah. Hey, all right. All right. Well, thank you all for joining the show. Really appreciate it. If you like the show, be sure to share this episode. Give us a nice review. Hit that subscribe button if you're on Rumble, YouTube. It absolutely really does help a lot. Of course, uh, the reviews help out a lot as well. Don't forget, you can also donate at patreon.com slash UFO no podcast where you get no ads, all my loyalty, and officially have added the first bonus content on there called cosmic news where I break down some technology and uh like uh the you know the newsy type stuff that's coming down the pike to see what's really coming so go check that out once again patreon exclusive so because i love you all um also be sure to go get yourself some sweet merch at the store got some cool stuff like our logo which is super badass you can get something with uh blind mike the blind one's face on it we're still trying to get him back um and uh and another one like uh, cosmic blue balls which is super awesome uh just click the link in the description the show notes you that's where you'll find everything but i cannot thank any of you enough i love you each and every single one of you let's get right into this bad boy shall we well so, I, I just want to say you know i've been yes. thinking about blind mike and you know he's got to be at least three quarters of the way across the milky way by now i mean well you know here's the deal mike I mean, Ed, that's how much I miss him. That's how much I miss him. Uh, Here's the deal, man. We just don't know because we don't know if they're stopping for probes. If they just keep on going. If we ever get him back, I should. uh, Can I propose that we maybe shove a GPS up his ass? That way, next time he goes awry or AWOL and uh, takes off with a bunch of fucking aliens, then we know where he's at least at. Absolutely. It's going to be found in his GPS spot. That's where we're going to put it. (laughs) GPS spot. (laughs) That's where we're going to put it. Mike, you're not allowed to go anywhere without a tracker, so give us your nuts. We're going to put it right on his taint. You know, that doesn't seem to be messed with. Everything else seems to be messed with. That's true. Yeah. So, anyways. uh, All right. So, Valiant Thor. Let's get into this. Uh to preface this, this is all starting around um, the 60s. If you've heard this story before, Valiant Thor was supposedly a stranger at the Pentagon, uh, written by a guy named Frank Strangis. Uh, supposedly one of the only guys that actually met Valiant Thor that knew he was actually at the Pentagon. Um but let, let's let's I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let's start here. OK, President Eisenhower famously said 
We must guard against the acquisition of unwanted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. That sounded and what more, he was saying. That sounded that? more. That sounded more like Nixon than Eisenhower. But then again, I well, don't know what Eisenhower sounds like either. So he I mean, sounded he like be, that. He could. He be sounded <laughs> like that. <laughs> what he was saying is he was warning about the threat of an unchecked military, a military that is growing without any checks and balances, as they like to say. Got to keep it um, in check. Yeah. Now, here's the question proposed by this man, Frank Burr, uh, uh, Strangest, was did he come to this realization himself, a conflict of conscience after a significant career in the military, or was this warning given to him by this man, Valiant Thor, um, who is uh, from Venus, I believe. Uh, but we'll get into the whole thing. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about this person, Valiant Thor, who could have been this person that gave the warning. Supposedly an alien from Venus came to Earth in 1957 to help fix humanity's problems. But the guy that we actually are going to talk about first a little bit is this guy, Frank Strangest, Dr. Frank Strangest, as he calls himself. So Dr. Frank put out this pamphlet in 1960 called My Friend from Beyond Earth, where he claimed to meet an alien from Venus named Valiant Thor. Then in 67, he had a book that came out where he detailed a lot more of this encounter called Stranger at the Pentagon. But he didn't stop there. He put out almost a dozen other books about this guy, Valiant Thor, over the decades. Pretty lucrative deal, all in all. So over the years, other people claim to have met Valiant Thor, like Eisenhower's great-granddaughter, Laura Eisenhower, who also happened to love Dr. Frank's stories. And hmm. so for those, what's that? Oh, I said, hmm. Yeah. So for those that aren't familiar or haven't read Dr. Frank's books, I'm going to give a, a little overview here, not the full story, but just a little overview. So here it is. Story goes on March 15th. Now you can go buy, you could go check out the book, by the way, once again, Stranger at the Pentagon. I'll put the link in the show notes. You can go check out the book for yourself. Goes into way more detail. I'm not going to give you the whole story because to me, it's not worth going over. We're just going to highlight it. So story goes March 15th, 1957 in Alexandria, Virginia, two police officers. Now, mind you, all of this is according to Frank Strange's book. Okay. Okay. His account only. All right. Two police officers were in a clearing chatting about their patrols when a strong wind came out of nowhere, followed by the sudden appearance of a shimmering metal saucer as wide as a football field and a central tower in the middle of it, nine stories tall, floating 10 feet off the ground while light uh, with lights pulsing slowly landed in this field. So as mm -hmm. these officers are staring at this ship, a door opens in the craft and a ramp comes down to the ground and a person walks out. He's about six feet tall with brown eyes, brown hair, handsome face. And according to Dr. Frank, this guy didn't look alien at all, except for a single uh, one piece suit without seams that had a bright hue to it. So the police snapped out of their shock, pulled their guns and then they both hear a voice in their heads telling them that this person is not their enemy, that he's there to make their world anew. So according to Frank's story, the officers could feel the man's intentions along with hearing his voice. So they could feel that he had only good intentions. So they lowered their weapons. And one, uh, one of the officers asked the man, what's your name? So the man continues walking towards him and says out loud, you would not understand my name if you heard it in my own tongue, you earthlings, but 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. You could not understand my name if you heard it in my own tongue, but you earthlings may call me Valiant Thor, Val for short. And apparently from this, they also knew he was there to see the president. Keep in mind, here's what's interesting about this. Even in the story, in the book, these police officers are never named. Of course not. They, right? And that no police officers have ever come forward to corroborate this story. So keep that in mind. So once again, full account by Frank Stranges about these police officers who remain unnamed, never come forward to corroborate his story. However, according to his book, so again, that's where it's all coming from. Um, regardless, either way, story goes on. Val was taken by these two police officers to the Pentagon under uh, heavily guard surveillance, the whole deal. You know, it's the Pentagon. Uh, and apparently, as Val approached the area, his presence could be felt and caused the guard dogs to go crazy. And sensing what was going on, the police officers apparently stopped their car and were going to let Val out of the, of the car for some reason. But before they could, apparently he was just outside the car. Okay. So Val raises his arms, show uh, all the guards and everybody that he comes in peace. And while his arms are raised to signify that he came in peace. Um, now, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt this a bunch of times because to me this story is somewhat ridiculous. But let's let's go over the whole thing real quick. A saucer right. lands in a field, steps out, guy steps out, there's police officers there, they escort him to the Pentagon. Does any of that sound familiar at all? It probably should. Uh so have you ever seen the day the earth stood still? Um, once a long, long time ago. So in that, so they made a remake in 2008, but in the original, I think it was 1951 in the original, there's a saucer that lands on a field. They're surrounded by military, not just two police officers, but after getting out and assuring them all, assuring all the officers that he's there in peace, they escort him to the Pentagon. Okay. So. Anyways, it's interesting how this all kind of came out, like 51 happens, and then in 1967, this book comes out by Frank Stranges, talking about this, and it's very, very similar. But anyways, that's, again, you can check out the book, but to me, it was very, very similar to this, this uh, the Day of the Earth so Still movie. Yeah, kind of like somebody just wants to profit off of a common, like a, a new fad or trend. Kind of like what happens nowadays. Yeah, exactly. Well, and yeah, yeah I mean, you With have the hype things, up. Of course, but yeah. Of course, yeah. But you have the hype up of aliens in general. You know, 47 was Roswell. That whole time period up till the 60s was kind of a big deal. <clears throat> but anyways, there's a plenty of movies out there about aliens coming to Earth, warning humans about uh, our horrible behavior and how they're going to help us, you know, and all that stuff. So that whole theme has been copied a lot. But either way, the story continues that as he's got his arms raised, he assures the guards he's there in peace. And because apparently because of Val's positive energy that's radiating from him, the dogs stop barking and the, uh, the guards got all friendly all of a sudden. So then they escort him. Several guards take him inside to meet the Secretary of Defense. So again, now here's a common theme in Dr. Frank's books, okay. is that people aren't named. All right? So in this, the police officer so far haven't been named, and then the Secretary of Defense is not named in the book. Interesting. So it, yeah. Now, it could have been, it could have been, that that's because Frank didn't know who the secretary of defense was at the time, but it also is very convenient that he doesn't name any of these people. He just says, Oh, and he met with the secretary of defense. Yeah. You know? And I, and I had dinner with Elvis last week. Egg, yeah, exactly. So it, it's, it's convenient and uh, not very, it doesn't, 
instill a lot of confidence into the accuracy of the story. You know what I mean? Right. Like we've talked about many, many times before, you know, yeah. almost adding too much detail and, and trying to floof it up, floof it up. Yeah. If anything happened in this case at all. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and in this case, a detail you do want to include is people's names. Right. Right. You know, you absolutely want to say, uh, you know, secretary of defense, whatever, Billy Bob Thornton, you know, whoever it is, um, then that's, you want to make sure, cause that adds credibility, but trying to speculate as to size and distance and all those things, they, they take away credibility, right. you know? So there's, there's a, a balance there, but again, like I said, it's, it's fairly convenient and a, and a common theme in these, but anyways, either way, this unnamed secretary of defense asks Val why he's there. Val's seamless suit forms some kind of a pocket and he pulls out a small alien device, presses a button and it shows some alien language in a hologram. And according to the story, Everyone that was in the room could understand this alien language that like their minds could translate it. Um, Val could see their confusion on their faces. And so he explained to them that it was possible due to telepathic translation, his people's way of speaking the meaning of words directly into readers. That's kind of an, an interesting idea. Right. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Because, you know, something that we struggle with a lot, especially these days, is context. Yes. You know, things taken out of context. So if you have telepathic translation like they're doing and speaking the meaning of these words, then that would eliminate uh, phrases out of context. Right. Right. Yeah. So anyways, I, I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. Um, so the message that they got was a step-by-step plan to avoid nuclear advancement, get rid of all fossil fuels, cure all diseases and solve world hunger and war forever. But the secretary of defense decided before they, uh, went any further, they were going to get the president involved. So according to Dr. Frank, they took Val to a secret elevator in the Pentagon that led to a tunnel and boarded a train under Washington, D.C. that led to another elevator taking them directly to the Oval Office. What's funny is a bunch of, when I, when I was looking into this, a bunch of people called bullshit on that, that element of a secret elevator in the Pentagon that leads to a secret tunnel, leads to a secret train under Washington, D.C. that leads to the Oval, you know, to the White why, House. Why, why were they calling bullshit? Well, because they were like, oh, plans for Washington, D.C. have never shown that there was a train there. And I'm going, okay, hold on. Of all the things in the story, you're going to get hung up on a secret train under Washington, D.C. It would not surprise me at all if there is actually a secret elevator to a secret tunnel that boards a special train that leads directly (laughs) to the White House. That would not surprise me in the least. In fact, to me, that would be the least... uh, surprising surprising thing. part of the whole story yeah right <laughs> yeah is i would absolutely believe that yeah me too i mean look what look what they do with hitler man i mean they had tunnels everywhere it's crazy oh no shit yeah yeah, yeah that that blows my mind bad yeah dude that I yeah love that shit i know me too and it really opens your mind to the fact that we don't know shit no the we the don't winner. know shit history is so flawed yeah history is written by the winner absolutely absolutely and even then it's retranslated again and again depending yep. on who you know who uh benefits from having the information out there right yeah so uh apparently here's how the conversation went once they get to the white house so eisenhower says where do you come from space man Val says, I come from the planet your Bible calls the morning and the evening star, Venus. Eisenhower says, can you prove it? And Val says, come to my ship, see for yourself. And of course, uh, President Security says, no. (laughs) So Eisenhower says, there's protocol and whatnot. Keep me at my post. Otherwise, I would go in a heartbeat. Then Richard Nixon comes into the room, shakes Val's hand. And they get right down to business, talk about this plan for the future of mankind. So Eisenhower tells Val 
that America's best scientists are going to run some calculations, see if the proposal is legit. But in the meantime, he says that Val can stay at some apartment at the Pentagon. So Val says yes. Then Nixon asks him if the boys in R&D can take a look at his clothes, the shiny one piece. And Val says they can go for it. Uh, as long as there's other clothes for him to change into, of course, Eisenhower tells him, yep, plenty of clothes. Um, so Val goes to the Pentagon to this small apartment, hanging out, gets a call, but it's not specified where he gets the call from, whether it's over the, uh, hotel, the, the small apartment phone, some kind of a cosmic phone, some kind of a transmitter of some kind. Other, anyways, yeah, it doesn't specify. Something, yeah. yeah, something. Either way, he gets some call from his crew, Don, Jill, and Tanya. Uh, Jill tells Val that they got word of some humans who believed in aliens, and they, they were gathering, and that Don and her wanted to go incognito for to go get intel. Uh, Val thought it was an okay idea, told him that he was going to go to this meeting also, and that, uh, or I'm sorry, told them about the meeting between Eisenhower, Nixon, and him and the small apartment, the Pentagon that they could use, um, and that he was going to meet him at the ship. And I tell you all that because it's kind of doesn't matter, but I tell you all that because later on it comes there, there's some things that happen that go into why he would need to. Well, first of all, how did they know where he was? Right. You know, how did his crew know where he was? How did they know where to call? And then why would he need to show them where they are if they were to, if they were able to call him? You know what I'm saying? Right. And you would think if they're like advanced aliens that are there to solve world hunger, they know about GPS. Oh, for sure. Even back then. Yeah, and the fact that, yeah, they can end all wars, but they can't locate somebody? Come on. Give me a break. So that's, you know, that this is where it starts to fall apart for me, you know, is things like that. Um, So he goes to leave. Two Secret Service agents outside the door tell him, can't go. He's like, well, what am I, a prisoner? They said, no, you're in an apartment, not a cell. We just want you to stay put. And, uh, so Val apparently turns on the trans imagery technology he'd used before to trans, uh, to show them some top secret ID. And so he ends up getting this top secret ID that basically makes one up, makes up a, an ID on the spot with this hologram technology. Um, so anyways, gets out gets through every checkpoint in the Pentagon, goes outside, catches a cab to the ship. Uh, and then after meeting these his cohorts, they head to this UFO convention in a backyard belonging to this guy, Howard Mensher. And again, I tell you all this because why did he need to catch a cab to get back to his ship if he had a magic thing that could make an ID pop out of anywhere? Right. And wouldn't he so just take the train back? Wouldn't he just take <laughs> the, the train? Secret, yeah. I mean, unless, I mean, they, it was, it they were saying that, you know, that he wasn't allowed to leave. So maybe the train is in control of the government. So that's why he can't use the train. But I just find it fascinating that again, we're going back to that. He's given a message to say he, that, you know, he is able to solve world hunger and wars uh, all this stuff, but he's got to flag down a cab to get back to a ship. I just don't get it. But he's got magical light that can that can make an ID out of nothing. Yeah. So little things like this. I'm just like, what? Uh, so anyways, and, and what you call that in, you call that convenient writing. All right. We've all seen it in movies. We've all seen it in TV shows where somebody magically has a wrench. Yeah. Or somebody is conveniently able to just run away from something and not get caught. And we're like, what? It's a people pleaser. 
It's a people plea. It helps the mo- the the story move along because otherwise you would have a massive hurdle. So what do you do? You come up with a convenient but somewhat out of place solution. And to me, that's what these sound like. You know, he's got to catch a cab to go, but he can have an ID pop up out of nowhere to get through checkpoints. So limited. Why yeah. limited? You know, limited because the writer had no imagination. You know what I mean? Yep. Not because it was a real event in my mind. Uh, so anyways, they go to this UFO convention. Um, and there's word that this UFO convention actually happened because apparently, according to Dr. Frank, there is a picture that was taken by a guy named August Roberts that was in this group that took a picture of Val and his crew. Um, but the picture, is, you can't really tell. I mean, literally, I could, you know, you can go on and, and punch in Valiant Thor image, and all you're going to get is a bunch of book title covers and then you're going to find some random picture of some random guy sitting on a bench with a few other people around him it literally doesn't there's nothing to identify that he would be anything other than in fact there's even rumors that it was uh a picture of young frank himself (laughs) instead of valiant thor so anyways um so this is when uh, apparently, uh, let's see. Oh no. Anyways, anyways. Uh, so this picture happens supposedly that that's where they have proof of them. So after this, they meet a few people, then they go back to the Pentagon. Val does anyways, the other guys apparently go back to the uh, ship and, so Val goes back, talks to Eisenhower and Nixon again, and they tell Val that they're not going to be able to go with his plan because it would devastate America's economy, but they tell him that he can stay at the Pentagon and consult. Uh, so Val decides he's going to stay at the Pentagon to do some recon and find someone that can help him get his message out to the public about trying to save the world because apparently the government's not going to help. So after three years at the Pentagon that uh, Valiant Thor has been there, this is when he meets Dr. Frank, who was in Washington, D.C. for a book signing uh, for his book, Flying Saucer AMA, Collection of Investigations into UFO Phenomenon. And during this sighting, a woman named Nancy Warren comes up to Dr. Frank has this book inside the book. There's apparently a high clearance Pentagon ID and that she's going to sneak him into the Pentagon to meet with Val, Valiant Thor. Okay. So they, they arrange this meeting the next day. He meets Nancy at his hotel and they, that this is when Dr. Frank claims that to have met Valiant Thor is being snuck into the Pentagon. And he says that right away, as soon as he met him, he knew he was an alien And during this meeting, Val explains that he was there as an advisor sent by God himself. So here's where it transitions from just a consultant for the Pentagon or for the, for the government, some, some alien to it blending with Dr. Frank's religious beliefs. Okay. So during this meeting, apparently Val explains that he was there as an advisor sent by God himself and that he had been created along with Adam and Eve and that he was close personal friends with Jesus Christ. Then he shows Dr. Frank that he didn't have fingerprints, that fingerprints were a mark on humans because we broke commandments of the Lord. Val also showed that he didn't have a belly button since he was created instead of born. All this is in Dr. Strange's book, okay? as to proof uh, that he was an alien. Let me tell you something about the belly button thing. I can't explain the fingerprints deal other than people can burn off their fingerprints. Yeah. But my dad doesn't have a belly button. It's what? not because he's an alien, okay? It's because no. he had a hernia surgery, uh, and they had to close it up, but you can barely tell anything happened to him. Like, he does it barely even has a scar. So it only, it just pretty much looks like he has no belly button. 
So he, you, should, you should just start telling people he's an alien because it, it'd make a more I interesting mean, story. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree. But I'm just saying in this situation, like to have no belly button or fingerprints, well, I can explain those for other means. Right. Yeah, aside from it. being an alien. You know, a, like I said, a person can burn off their fingerprints and a person can close their belly button. So anyways, so then he explains that he's on a mission to bring spirituality back to earth, but he failed because politicians were too worried about their bottom line and a shadowy cabal of business interests, religious authorities and powerful men did not want to give up their power, even if it meant uh, they could cure all disease. So Dr. Frank asked Val if he, if the world's leaders had rejected his message, could the world ever truly improve? Val said he was uh, assisting in other ways like developing space medicine for astronauts. Space medicine for astronauts that Val apparently developed. developed. According to Dr. Frank, uh, Valiant Thor tasked him with delivering this message of spiritual enlightenment to the people of the world. Then he goes into this whole long self-glorification spree saying how Val told him that his book had been inspired by God, goes on to say how he knew he was being guided by God while he was writing it. Then he says that Val disappeared right in front of him, uh, which makes me ask the reason why I told you all about the ID shit. If he could just disappear out of the Pentagon anytime, why did he need a cab? Why did he need an ID? He wanted to feel more human. Right? <laughs> Just play the game? I mean, so anyway, so apparently he can teleport whenever he wants. He just chooses really dumb times to do it. So that is the basic overview of Stranger at the Pentagon. Okay? okay. But I do recommend you go check it out for yourself. So then he goes and he writes a second edition of this book. Goes on a worldwide tour, spreading Valiant Thor's message and his claimed experience of being targeted by shadowy government. Uh, so here's here's what's kind of funny. Um, this is kind of the decline of of Doctor Strangest and his claims. Okay. Oh, I bet. So in, <laughs> in Germany, 67, he claimed that he was poisoned by two men, claimed to be reporters asking questions about Valiant Thor, never was corroborated. In ni early 1973, claims that Val popped into the backseat of his car one day while driving to tell him that he needed to write more books focusing on the teachings of the Venetians or the from Venus people. Now, as skeptical as I am about Dr. Frank Stranges and his stories of Valiant Thor, which I am very, there are a lot of people who believe in Valiant Thor. In fact, there's a group called the Inner Circle, uh, and I think they still exist, of UFO believers who claim they've been spiritually enlightened by his teachings. That is Valiant Thor's teachings. But Valiant Thor's teachings can only be found in Dr. Strange's books. So I argue that it's Dr. Frank's teachings through this character, Valiant Thor. So I had mentioned earlier that Laura Eisenhower who claimed that even though she didn't know the specifics about the meetings between Eisenhower and aliens, she was confident that he had met with an alien from Venus. Now, mind you, again, all this comes from one guy, Dr. Frank. Laura Eisenhower's belief in Valiant Thor is from Frank's stories. Well, the and entire, look, and look how... Sorry, look how quick no, no. Inf information from a doctor can travel. Um, if you remember uh, a while back, and I mean, and still people still believe this, but it was proven to be false, is the vaccines cause autisms. And oh, yeah. it was just from one doctor who didn't do the, the research correctly and then published his findings anyway, knowing they were wrong. Like, Well, there there's a lot of tons of bad 
published science. Mm-hmm. You know, tons of it, terrible stuff. I mean, it's it's horrible. But uh, yeah, what what you have is you have people that. And, and I'm not trying to knock anybody. You know, if anybody believes in this stuff, they found enlightenment through these books. They believe it's improved their lives in some way. That's great. Um, but the entire story, the entire story is from one guy. And mind you, again, it, it lacks specifics like names of guards, names of political figures. Um even the claims by Eisenhower's great granddaughter are based on the stories from Frank Strangis and, and all of these people that he believes in are vouching for his credibility because he was supposedly highly educated. He was supposedly a pastor. Well, maybe Um, he was, you know, he had a following as well. So yeah, well probably helped. Yeah, well, here's what's interesting about his whole credibility of being highly educated and all this stuff and a pastor is the truth is he never had any PhDs in anything. He claimed to have had PhDs in theology, in, um, I mean, a bunch of stuff. I can't remember what it was. It was like four different PhDs. But here's the truth. He never had any PhDs in anything. He apparently did go for a bachelor's degree in theology at North Central University, but no one's sure if he actually graduated because he ended up going balls deep into ufology, alien research, sci-fi, and pop culture. So then his whole thing about being um, a, a pastor comes from him claiming to be the president of the International Evangelism Crusades, which he said was a worldwide religion, but doesn't actually seem to exist. Weird. So then on top of that, on top of that, he also claimed to be the president of the International Theological Seminary of California. What's funny about this is that this organization, specifically the International Theological Seminary of California, was started in 1982 by a real doctor named John Huan Kim, who was Korean. Hmm. So here this guy is literally just throwing shit. I mean, think, you know, that's cool about the 70s. I got to say, imagine being able to just run around and say you're this and people just believe you. Yeah. Because you could never get away with that now. Well, yeah, work take a you lot could, of work, a lot, a of, work. lot of work, more work, yeah, than a lot of worth. work, <laughs> and a lot of people willing to not look into anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so even funnier than that is that since he wasn't a doctor, but he was doing these seminars as a doctor, he was giving people fake diplomas after completing these seminars with him. So he would charge like. 50 bucks, 100 bucks for these seminars and then give people these fake diplomas afterwards. <laughs> what a piece of shit, dude. Dude, so during during UFO, I mean, this guy's top notch. During UFO conferences, he even claimed that he was a chief investigator for NICAP, which is also known as the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, which was or is, depending on how you look at it, a real thing because either they, you know, here's the deal. They've, they had NICAP, they had a tip, they have this new one. That's now they're all the same thing, but they're all just change the name and they get new funding, all that shit. So it's all the same thing. Any, anything in the government that's saying they're tracking aerial phenomena, UFOs, it's all the same thing. They just keep changing the names. So that's why I said was, or is because, it was a legitimate group, but then they said they didn't do that anyone one anymore and they have a new one. But I argue that it's all the same thing. Oh yeah. I bet. I bet it is. Yeah. So, but he was only a member of this group. NICAP, meaning he made a monthly donation. That's it. That's all it takes to be a card holder is to make a monthly donation. And I think it's anywhere from like a hundred bucks a month to whatever the fuck. 
So in fact, after all this, they found out, Nightcap found out that Frank was saying all this shit at UFO conferences. So they pulled his membership. And then in, in 1963, he was convicted of making these fake diplomas. And also sometime in 63, it's not really sure of when exactly, he was arrested for drug smuggling that he claims he was framed by shadowy government. Then in 1964, he made a documentary called Phenomena 7.7 7, 7 .7 that focused on one UFO sighting that happened the same year in Socorro, New Mexico. Um, but it didn't go very far due to several reasons. Um, but what's funny, you can't even find an original copy of this uh, documentary made. You can okay. go... Yeah, you can go and find a bunch of info about Socorro, New Mexico, which is kind of an interesting encounter with a cop that uh, chased a UFO. So anyways, but that brings us up to the point in 1967 where Frank wrote Stranger at the Pentagon. So here he had gone through all this, right? He's gone through all this shit trying to kind of bring something back to his name. So he writes this book, Stranger of the Pentagon. Same year, he founded this group, uh, NICUFO, which is the National Investigations Committee on Unidentified Flying Objects. Again, clearly trying to gain some credibility. And I guess it worked because fucking NBC gave him a show called Flying Saucers Here and Now. But after one episode... Word got out to the UFO community that Frank was involved, so they piled on it, saying that he was involved. If if he's involved, there was no way it was going to have credibility because of the investigations he'd been a part of before. So basically, Frank was now known as a complete bullshit artist willing to lie for money. And that's right after the book was written. Wow. So... What does that mean for this person, Valiant Thor, that Frank wrote about? Does that mean he wasn't real because Frank lied about virtually everything else? I mean, I don't know. The hard part is the only person who has ever... Basically, the person who invented Valiant Thor or came up with the original story of how he met Valiant Thor, claiming that he was even a person or, or real, is in his books. And once again, he's lied about virtually everything else in his life. So that makes me think his stories are made up. Yeah, he's definitely not a credible person. Certainly. So... But let's break down the story again. Let's let's go through this a little bit more. Valiant Thor was an alien, supposedly stayed at the Pentagon for three full years, working with Eisenhower himself. Wouldn't that mean that anyone, someone working at the Pentagon at that time would have stories of this? Yeah. Any Literally anybody else. Because mind you, when he was at the Pentagon was before he meant Dr. Strangis. Three years before. So three years prior to that, Dr. Strangis meets him and there's no record of him prior to that. So that's fishy. Mm -hmm. um, no one's ever put in a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act request, for Valiant Thor or anything on him. See if he's real. Even like places like the Black Vault, things that do that. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -mm. Uh, the Black Vault .com, You can go check it out. They got, uh, I mean, he's got his own takes on stuff, but uh, I think it's uh, something Greenwald. I can't remember what it is. John Greenwald. Um, he does thousands of FOIA requests for UFO material. And so mm -hmm. he's got, his website is one of the most, uh, one of the largest archives of declassified actual documents. So 
it's not like a whole bunch of stories and articles written out. I mean, he does have some of those. A lot of it is just going through and looking at original documents that say, you know, MJ-12 and talk about UFOs and shit. So, yeah. Uh, I wish I had the patience to go through more of those types of documents. Yeah, me too. Well, and not only that, but most of it is like, you know, paragraph, 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 UFO. And, yeah. And then redaction, you know, it's, redaction. Fucking. Yeah, exactly. And so, and look, I mean, with people out there like John Greenwald doing it, hey, man, thank you. Like, so we don't have to. We can just go catch the highlights. Right. You know, but again, you know, I the other thing is people, people wonder about these, you know, they want to say, oh, well, this memo exists, so therefore it must be legit. Well, let's let's talk about the fact that the government has been hiding its tracks, not only hiding its tracks, but also like putting people off the trail by faking documents. Yep. Faking evidence. So I don't think anything can be trusted. I mean, no. coming from the government, when you have a document that says MJ-12, how do you know that wasn't, you know, made to look that way? You know, again, we have, in my opinion, one of the largest cover-ups isn't the fact that aliens exist, which I, I'm neither here nor there. I haven't seen evidence one way or the other enough to make me believe that it's aliens. I, I think there's plenty to show us it's our own government and world governments that are doing this. That's what we see. Um, but we have enough from our government that shows us they will do virtually anything to, to make you believe something, you know, that they've been covered. This is one of the biggest cons cover ups ever of them, them, protecting their ass of of advanced technology stealing the world's technology for their own means and putting it in space i 100 percent believe that yeah i could i can, yeah 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 so with with all these classified projects that have been done by the government like mk ultra operation paperclip a whole any number of the crazy shit that's been released in the last 10 years declassified wouldn't something about Valiant Thor have been released? Anything? You would, you would think so. You would think so. Something. Somebody would be, I mean, think about, once again, Operation Paperclip. Gigantic, huge declassified operation bringing Nazis over um, and giving them uh, immunity here at uh, in uh, the U.S. But MK Ultra, one of the sickest projects done by our government to experiment on people using drugs and mind manipulation. So here we have all that, but they won't talk about a, a potential weird Nordic alien in the Pentagon. I don't know. Yeah, that's a trip. I don't know. Maybe, but, um, Here's the rub, in my opinion, as humble as it is. Frank Strangis was a known con man. Uh, if for nothing else than giving out fake diplomas, but he was also caught in several lies during this time when he told the stories of Valiant Thor that are also very similar to a couple of different movies at the time, The Day the Earth Stood Still and another one, Stranger from Venus. Um, but what it really comes down to is that we'll never know if Valiant Thor was real or not because Frank lied about so many other things. In my opinion, he has zero credibility, as you said, Ed. Right. Zero credibility. So how can we how can we give any credibility to his stories? You can't. That no, you can't. You can't. Based on his past history, to just say, well, yeah, he fucked up before and he fucked up after, but during this one time, 
during this one period of time when he wrote these books, he was legit. He didn't do it for any other reason other than to get this Valiant Thor's message out. He made money off of that. Oh, I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. But, again, like I said, it doesn't stop people from believing Frank's stories. So, who am I to judge? I mean, people believe all kinds of things, yeah? Yeah, but I don't know. Logically, this one's in sound. I mean, look, man, I've read other books about a guy that wanted to come and save the world, and it seemed kind of outlandish, but a lot of people believe that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, it's I mean, crazy. there's all kinds of... That's the that's the crazy thing about belief. Belief is an incredible, powerful thing. Yes. It can lead people to lead better, more fulfilling lives, like a lot of spiritual people say it does. The Bible. Yeah. Um, but belief has also led to a lot of really bad stuff, too. Yeah. You know, the belief in certain rules and laws and, you know, spiritual uh, morality over other people and judging them harshly, violently because of that. Yeah, it can That's all been done. Yeah. Eas- easily turn in, can, belief can be turned into control. Yeah. Like, that's a fine line kind of there. That's right. So... As is the, the the theme for this show, I want to believe in Valiant Thor. I want to believe that he actually came and consulted for the government during the time of Eisenhower trying to make the world a better place. I really do want to believe that. It's a fun, it, it's a fun tale. Yeah. It might be, in fact, the first time that anyone's ever gone to the Pentagon to actually try and help anyone. (laughs) Yeah, no shit. (laughs) I think, me personally, I think that people, what people like about these stories is the message. The message that people, us, humans, the people of the world, we have to do away with shitty government and help ourselves. Is that not the message of Valiant Thor? Yeah. He came to the planet to meet with the world's leaders to show them a plan, a way out of out of terrible future. Whether it be hunger whether it be nuclear whatever disease and and, you know with how this story is like and humans being so ignorant even if this story was true like we still probably wouldn't have done (laughs) we still would have done it to make the world better place well look i mean look people people that believe in the bible you know i'm agnostic about a lot of things but look at what they did to jesus Came to the war. Came to the world supposedly, bringing people together, formed this movement of people that could come and worship together, and then they put them to death. You know that's the story. Way to go, humanity! Yeah, way to go, humanity! So, but it, re- it really, I mean, look, I like the story because again, you have a guy that comes to meet with leaders of the world to tell them this plan and they turn him down. So he turns to the people instead and the people take on this message and try and spread it themselves. And that's what I thought was a cool message out of it. Yeah. So whether Frank Strangis and Valiant Thor, well, whether Frank Strangis is really a piece of shit, I don't think is uh, in debate, but whether Valiant Thor was real or not, that's debatable. But again, we can take something away from these stories, leaving Frank's shitty person aside, that we as people, we can make this change. We can do these things. We don't we don't need government. You know, government needs us. You know what I mean? Right. Fuck those guys. 
Yeah, sure. We don't need government or aliens to help us. That's right. That's right. We can do it our damn selves. Absolutely. But the only question that remains is the greatest one, which is what do you all think? Huh? I want to know. I want to know what you think. Let me know in the comments. If you're watching on YouTube, put it in the comments. Let me know what you thought of this episode. Um, if you're on Patreon, of course, let me know. Talk to me. Um, if you have stories, you have experiences, or you just want to reach out, you can email us, uh, which is in the show notes. And as I'm trying to do, people, I'm trying to do, we are building... A UFO no army. And I want you. So donate now. Patreon.com. To my OG supporter, the first army member is designer tinfoil hat wearing Aaron Rice. Aaron, thank you so much. As always, you started this parade. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Casey Armadillo, first merch buyer and now member of the UFO No Army. Michael Benavides, thank you, you dude. Tell me some stories from Roswell. I really want to know. Michael Ralston, love you, man. Thank you. And new, uh, just joining the ranks to the UFO No Army, Jesse E. What's up, Jesse E? Thank you for coming in. I appreciate it very, very much. You too can be a part of the UFO No Army at patreon.com, where we are going to be releasing a new episode each week just for members. Again, ad free and just added some bonus content. Go check that out. Cosmic news. And I'm going to be adding some more stuff very soon. Any donation means the world to me completely. Absolutely. I love you all. Thank you so much. Now for general shout outs, I want to thank the Black Coast, this killer band out of the UK, uh, and Wet Wired, their merch, I do believe. Uh, thanks for the shout out, guys. They are always sharing on the socials. I really appreciated that. It means the world to me. Uh, Bob Sowen, always commenting on the YouTube videos. Appreciate that very much, sir. I thought uh, you were going to say... Oh, sorry. I thought you were going to say Bob Saget for a second. <laughs> <laughs> that would be super rad from beyond the grave. Um, uh, Casey Lisi, good friend. Uh, always listen to the show. Thanks, dude. Very much so. And I want to give a big shout out to Rihanna and her fiance. Thanks, Rihanna. She reached out to me recently. We chatted about the show, had a great conversation. Thank you so much. And of course, you all can reach out as well. Email the show, reach out on the socials, however you can. Uh, everyone who's bought merch, you can tag UFO No Podcast with your sweet ass gear. Help us build a portfolio of fans that we can show to the world. Uh, if you want to get a shout out, let me know. You listen to the show or donate. It's that simple, people. It is that simple. Get involved. Let's do this. I want to take over the world. Let's do this. UFO No Army. Ed, yep. where can the people find you, man? Well, you guys can find me at Linktree forward slash Red Tide Studio. Um, I've got my Life Talks with Edwin Everhart on there right now, and it's going to be archived so you guys can still listen to it. But I am getting ever so much closer to the release date of my new podcast, uh, Strange Addictions, where we talk about strange circumstances. And uh, did I say Strange Addictions? Uh, I meant to say strange circumstances. I don't know why I said strange addictions. <laughs> the show's called Strange Circumstances, and it's kind of like a, a true crime podcast about the unknown as far as uh, crimes and uh, that kind of stuff. It's it's going to be real, real fun. Uh, I've got my first episode recorded, but I'm going to wait a little bit because uh, I'm still working out a few kinks and details uh, before I post it. But you guys will be the first to know when I do. Fucking A. Chomping at the bit, man. Chomping, Chomping at the, the bit. bit for this show. I'm very, very excited. I've got a uh, very early sneak peek at his work, and y'all, you're going to love it. It's so much fun. So, uh, Ed, you are uh, a great content creator, and I'm very excited for you to put this out. Well, thank you. I, I'm, oh. I'm very excited for this one as well. Yeah, man. Well, again, thank you all for joining the show. Another phenomenal episode of UFO No. Remember to reach out, share this episode with your friends. It really does help. But for us, that is it. 
As always, people, keep your eyes to the skies. And remember, watch out for the government. They're shoisty bastards.